Oh, then I'll take it. Uh, then I'll take it down uh, for ease. That's how I look. At, uh, I look like it's a weekend. I'm at home in my study room, and so not much greater to see else apart from the shining light. So I'll briefly leave the video on for a while, and then turn it off and uh, use audio. Is it okay to use audio, James? Yes, that's fine. You can proceed. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. So I want to thank you for inviting me to this forum. And I'm truly honored that you feel that my story and experience can inform, motivate, inspire, and even perhaps warn you about your what your life would be like, even though, every, uh, though life is a, a very individual experience. Uh, but there are things and trends that modify our communal experiences so deeply that they determine our own individual experiences and success. So I am happy to share my life experiences, if only it can help us uh, in this end, like be able to know what our individual experiences and successes could be like. Now, as I wondered what to speak about this forum when I was invited by your chair, Lucy, um, I asked him to try and organize some issues that we could go through since that is perhaps what is more relevant and impactful than me relentlessly narrating my personal story. Uh, however, I see there are certain personal experiences you would want me to narrate, and I'll try to do that as faithfully and truthfully as possible. Uh, your questions and talking cues, I must confess, are very detailed and relevant, and I hope that is what you will continue to pose for the many of us who come to speak to you in the coming days. And the ones who have spoken to you have spoken to you uh, faithfully and in truth, uh, so that we just don't create one picture of how great we are and not showing you what the reality is like in life. A lot of what I'll say does not require fact checking at all, though I will invite you to do it. Uh, but uh, neither should anyone uphold it as the necessary truth. It is simply the sum total of my lived experiences as a doctor to an extent as a Kenyan and a global citizen since I graduated in 1999. And much of it is directed along the areas you thought I would cover in the forum. So let me begin. My name is Moses Nerito, and I'll be turning 50 in just about eight months time. Although 50 is considered middle age, I am way past our middle age as a country whose life expectancy is considered to be somewhere between 62 and 68 years. And I am a bit surprised that that figure has been revised. It was standing somewhere about 66.7, 67 for males. Now I can see it's 62. I just don't know why it has been revised by World Bank. Now this reality hit us recently as a group of former classmates on the we were actually past our middle age as a country, even though everyone would think that we are middle age. However, I want to believe that I am middle age since I want to live until I am 100 years, of course, with a healthy body, mind, and soul, hoping not to be very frail. As I said, I graduated from medical school in 1999 at a tender age of 25 years, perhaps also the age at which most of you will be graduating soon or intend to come. I joined the Kenya Medical, the Kenya Defense Forces Memorial Hospital, then it was called Armed Forces Memorial Hospital, as an intern. And afterwards, I nearly joined the Defense Forces, as a number of my classmates did. But I had two other opportunities open for me. One was uh, to carry on immediately and pursue a master's in pathology at University of Nairobi, or a one year's master of philosophy and epidemiology at the University of Cambridge, United Kingdom. At that time, it was very fashionable to study abroad then. And obviously it was more efficient and easy to graduate than uh, locally. And I felt that it would offer me more opportunities as an epidemiologist and later as a physician or as a pediatrician. At the end of my studies in the UK, there were new opportunities to try. One was to take up a PhD with GSK and join the world of research to support pharmaceutical endeavors, or proceed to take up an SHO job in a UK hospital and eventually train in internal medicine, which was my interest. 
My supervisor at that point observed that I was a particularly gifted student and advised that I should seek further opportunities in the US. However, I never took that very seriously. I opted for the SHO route and enrolled and passed PLABS. I think most of you will have heard about PLABS, the entry exams to practice in the UK for you to be registered by the GMC. At that time, there was a global crisis where the best jobs were in the Western world. And even now, mostly it mostly remains so. And so the competition for uh, training opportunities was fierce. I would remember very well the UK would wax lyrical about employing foreign doctors, sometimes here, yes, sometimes no. And eventually this was suspended and it became difficult to get a training job. As I tried my luck, like the very, very many other young and good doctors from other parts of the world, I enrolled to do the MRCP, which is a membership of the Royal College of Physicians. But after some time, I had to return home urgently uh, due to personal reasons. That was in 2003. I was 31, then, energetic, and uh, I had a, view, a, a new view of how things could be done differently. I was not aware about, I was now aware about the evidence and capable of helping improve things using research but I still needed to mature my skills and way of doing things. At that point in time, if any one of you would remember, uh, there was a new government in Kenya and uh, things sounded very positive. And I sought to come back to my appointment as a medical doctor while I sought for opportunities as an epidemiologist. This was yet one of the most difficult times as there were no formal career paths for epidemiologists. Who was that? Even when I was training in Cambridge, that was the 10th year of the university trained epidemiologists, so not very well known. First at the MOH, then famously called Murphy House, uh, some government officers had taken up my promotion arrears and hid away my file. I said, I'm going to be very honest with you because they never thought I was going to come back. Yet I had a study leave. The new government had just promoted every doctor from earning about 11,000 shillings a month to earning 33,000 and then 51,000 within a span of less than a year. And uh, there were lots of arrears uh, for most of us. So by the time I came, my file was hidden. I couldn't find it. And I had to restart my life anew. I remember I tried seeking opportunities with NASCO. You're aware of NASCO, CAVI and other organizations dealing with HIV AIDS, as my thesis had been on HIV AIDS. It was not possible to get such an opportunity. Eventually, I got the job of a medical officer in research at Kenry Wellcome Trust. This is a job I had tried getting into in 2001, about two or three years before, about two years before. It was highly competitive then. But uh, over the next few years, as more opportunities opened, Somehow it had lost its uh, attractiveness. But this time uh, I, was, I was returning with a degree from Cambridge, so it was no brainer that I knew the stuff I was doing. And I got the job uh, very easily. I must confess the job was a bit unstructured and we were honestly KYM for welcome funded researchers. I nevertheless took up the job with Gasto, worked extra hard. Helped every person I found working there with research skills, especially study design and analysis. Because even though people are working in a, a research environment, they didn't have a formal way of uh, learning research. So they were learning it as they went by. With time, I grew, traveled a bit around the world. But deep down, it was a racially divided place that utilized Africans using the funds they raised from abroad, which were easy for foreigners. And this was also what I call the was what I call the global age of AIDS and aid. So AIDS, HIV, AIDS uh, opened up uh, tabs for global aid towards Africa. So during my time at Camry Welcome Trust, I learned a lot of hands-on pediatrics, taking care of children who are severely. I I hear I hear some noise. Am I audible, or should I? James, am I audible?
Uh, yes, Dr. Diritu, we can hear you quite clearly. Thank you. So I was just saying what I learned uh, in uh, Kemu Welcome Trust. So lots of hands-on pediatrics, taking care of children who are severely ill and required special procedures, as well as research into clinical child health and public health. The place was also increasingly changing, growing by leaps and bounds as money sources increased from international collaborations uh, that hardly involved Africans as principal investigators. While some of the grants were taken with the intention and promise to build capacity for Africans, they were misappropriated. And all of us were forced to take what was known as a pure research pathway instead of a mixture of clinical and research pathways. I still do not believe you can do research of benefit to patients when you never meet them at all. And the practice around the world is you have a certain proportion of time in research, often about 75%, and about 25% with patients. And that is to make you relevant. So if you don't do that, I believe you will be an illiterate researcher. During my time there, I enrolled to do now because of the amount of work I spent in pediatrics and what had become you know, like an accepted norm. I enrolled for the membership of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. Um, it seems like there's a problem. I'd have to turn off the video. Um, so, and as I said, I enrolled to do MRCPCH and I passed part one and two. However, I did not get the promised financial support to study despite grants taken in the name of supporting our master study uh, by the organization. The only opportunities available was to do clinical PhDs, which meant you did clinical work to gather data for other researchers, after which they gave you a PhD. I honestly didn't like that very much because I keenly became aware of the inequality within uh, the global health. Uh, uh, that was built into the work there. So uh, for, after working for about eight years, uh, we did organize to resist this in 2010. And some of you may have heard about it, some of you may not have heard about it. And we became labeled as a Camry or Campo Six. We were six doctors. And we went to court in 2011 and won in industrial court in 2014 a case which caused a lot of awareness on global health inequalities and was widely publicized. We have a loss in the Court of Appeal in 2018 and the Supreme Court in 2020, not because there was no merit, uh, but because it was, of course, embarrassing for the institutions that we were suing of uh, racial, racial and, uh, and uh, institutional discrimination. So Welcome Trust denied racism and supported Camry in doing so. But this was also the beginning point of racial exorcism in Welcome Trust. So they began taking stock of what they were doing. And they immediately put up workshops on how to resolve these issues. They removed unfair restrictions on grant application. They promoted locals to become directors and had others appointed as professors at University of Oxford. And surprisingly, even provided grants to foreign researchers to increase participation of minorities in research. And if you follow news keenly, this has recently culminated in Welcome Trust openly confessing that it had all along been racist after denial and unfavorably treating us. We lost, but we won. We won for African scientists, though many of the beneficiaries were opposed to our push. There's nothing new with that behavior and you will experience it with your colleagues and friends here as you mature in to life in all areas. Now, I've told you this story because it forms the basis of the next experience in my life. Because that is where I was able to meet my partners with whom we set up Afia Research Africa and Ubuntu Health Limited, which now owns about 30 primary healthcare facilities around the country, a specialized pediatric neurology facility in Nairobi that serves patients from as far as Comoros and DRC, and of course, Stone HMIS that I lead in designing and development. And this remains the most exciting part of my career so far. I also got my job with the government as a medical officer. Remember I explained to you I had lost it 11 years ago because of uh, um, people deciding to take my arrears. 
And this saw me become an epidemiologist at the county of Kiambu in 2014. I had been working in Kiambu before uh, during the research between 2008 and 2011 as part of my clinical PhD that I mentioned early on in my career path. And that is how I came to get into Kiambu because having worked with the people who were working there, they recognized uh, what I could bring into the department. So at Kiambu, I was involved in setting up the new Department of Health Post Devolution since 2014. And this was a totally different kettle of fish. The first five years of devolution were great. There was confidence to engage competence and counties wanted to do the best. I helped set up a research unit, support the implementation of many health system changes, grow capacity for research, monitoring, evaluation, and quality improvement, support pandemic response, among others. However, the last five years have been nothing short of a disaster of political succession that exposed how devolution may actually end up being chaotic because of changeability in administrative and implementation bureaucracy or into local politics. Nothing unusual, but poorly managed and without systems secured in law, policy and practice, they are not value for money for Kenyans. That's my view and others may also have their view too, but it has to be said. There are many things I'm involved in at policy and practice level, but now there is nothing more exciting than pushing the implementation of primary care as a solution to UHC, which most people still do not understand and are yet implementing. So that's basically a summary of my experience and uh, my trajectory in Korea. And you asked me a, a couple of other questions that I will endeavor to answer, and then I can hand over back to uh, James so that he can coordinate any other questions. And one of the questions you asked me or you wanted my views on was on fulfillment, on purpose and altruism. And of course, as I was considering these, I wondered why, uh, why, but I hope you can hear quite a lot of commitment and purpose and altruism in my life story. And I say I cannot be anything else but that mainly because that is how I was cultured in my upbringing and especially in high school. It has not always been easy, and there is more opposition than support for such orientation in our country. And perhaps most of the extreme experiences that I have related were rooted in my sense of justice, altruism, and commitment. Well, I do not intend to intend change the, that to accommodate either malaise or public indiscipline or individual, individual uh, uh, aggrandizement. I am very satisfied with that. And I have often avoid, avoided opportunities that would deny me the pride of being upright in my work. I want to see and work with more sad people because our country needs them to become better for everyone. If that means isolation because of my stand, it really is a sacrifice I'm willing to take. And I'll keep going on in that narrow path. So that's a summary of my career experiences. Of course, highly summarized, but also honest. You also wanted me to share my views on evolution of financing in healthcare and the role of private equity firms, of hedge funds, of private partnerships, of angel investors, and of venture capitalist groups in shaping the landscape of health in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I have just mentioned that 2000 to 2020 was what I call the global age of AIDS and aid. And I must, I must also add of an attempted Marshall Plan for Kenya, especially by the West and the Chinese. There was a massive inflow of private donor and public funds into our economy. And I have every reason to believe this was a major push for the economic growth that we experienced as a country. We know hedge funds, various hedge funds bought and relinquished ownership in health sector. And uh, you've heard about them. Some of them have gone under, others are still changing hands. However, there's a st still a strong belief in the role of private sector in our development. I feel it's largely a reality in Nairobi. I deeply feel that the majority of the country does not experience this growth and relies often on uh, government services and investment, which sometimes they are, they are there, but they may be of lower quality. Of course, there are a few private brands that have managed to penetrate, such as Safaricom, uh, banks like Equity, 
Uh, but on the health side of things, I'm not convinced that hype, the hypercapital investment in high-end facilities or singly operated practices, which often drive in area in urban areas, have a great future. And I will explain why. So I feel there's a need to rethink investment in the health sector by the private sector. First, and you will hear me uh, uh, emphasize much on this, to embrace primary health care where there is a large potential for growth. And secondly, to engage with family and general practitioners to accelerate the achievement of UHC through group practices and supporting primary care networks, which are strategies that are new. And I'll just talk briefly about them as you get along. This, of course, would mean formation of a political extension arm to champion primary care as a way to achieve UHC, which is very well uh, rooted in evidence. Also support for group family practices, embracing the primary care network strategy and provision of capitation funds to the population served by these practices. Currently, all our funds go to support secondary and tertiary care, which is expensive, accessible to only a small proportion of people, often towards the end of their life and subjected to massive conflict of interest through big business procurement. A primary care approach with support of care practices is the most effective bottom-up approach to health investment, but we must put our public funds through the NHIF and other insurance at that level if we intend to realize gains to patients and growth of the health enterprise, both private and public. You also wanted to hear my views on how to lobby for support and buy-in for new innovations from relevant stakeholders in the country and advance health innovation in a sustainable way. And I feel that we need first to embrace innovation as a way to change our, change our affairs, not just in health, but as a country. And this means adopting an approach of spending public money to fund innovation and startups. Most of our pub public funding goes into programs and systems that have very little impetus to catalyze and promote change, but support continuity that is neither evaluated properly for impact and never challenged to change uh, or deliver value for money for the public. While there's a proposed startup bill 2021, which will foster entrepreneurship, will the proposed Kenya National Innovation Agency become what we know of government agencies representing continuity that often sets us back, or will it come with a fresh mandate of clearly making sure we adopt and have a, an innovation and startup culture in dealing with our issues? Secondly, in health, we need a way of identifying what product and policy works and implement it uniformly with the ability to quickly recall it with emerging evidence to the contrary. While such is meant to, achieve, to be achieved through guidelines and standards, it's unsure where they are often adopted from. Each group comes up with its own evidence and puts it into these guidelines without a general consensus of what works and is of value for money for Kenyans. These would be achieved through an institute that evaluates emerging innovations and evidence that achieves value for money and fast tracks them for implementation. Otherwise, we continue to handle the same problem in 47 different ways without questioning which of those ways works and is value for money for the country. I think of something like the UK National Institute of Clinical Excellence, but these would look at evidence-based clinical practice as well as health policy. You also wanted to hear my view on the future of health technology in our country and the role of government, private companies, public companies, uh, foreign aid, and of private-public partnerships in adopting technology to streamline health through innovations such as uh, HMIS, like Stone HMIS, insurance payment platforms like Slate 360, Kenya EMR, telemedicine, computational drug discovery, and the possible role of AI as a tool in the evolution of health and its care in sub-Saharan Africa setting. Now, I will give a very summarized view because I believe you're going to maybe ask uh, deeper questions, perhaps even closer to where I work, if you will, and I'll answer them in that sense. Uh, but he, we did a review of the maturity of our health information system for what is uh, for an interoperable digital health information system. And what we found is that we are at nascent or emerging levels where activities 
in digital HIS happen by chance or are isolated and ad hoc efforts? Or if there are systems uh, within defined HIS uh, uh, and process and structures, they are not systematically documented and lack ongoing monitoring mechanisms. So imagine of a situation where our maturity is like, you know, we do things on an ad hoc basis, you know, when we feel like doing it. And of course, we have some structures and some processes, uh, but they are not very systematically documented. And we don't monitor whether we are achieving what we say we are achieving, as we do, uh, for example, with the provision of care, where we have KHIS and other, and other systems of tracking how we are we are actually implementing uh, uh, clinical care for patients directly. Now, all these players that you have mentioned, to me, have one role first, and that is developing and maturing the backbone for an interoperable health information system. We need to build an ecosystem, an interoperable digital HIS that can exchange standardized information. Now, why am I saying this? Computers became useful when they could all interoperate and most people could use them with little to no education in class. And when they were built using technology and communication systems with similar standards. Currently, many people can make an application, some form of a digital health theme. This is often time consuming and expensive. And when it, doesn't, and, and when it does not add value in health, I feel it's unethical in my view. Uh, and it's similar to conducting a trial of a drug with no intention of ever making it available to patients. And in fact, and I want to mention this because it's a, an experience we've had, there is obviously a procurement mercantilism or procurement as you know it, and it has identified digital health systems as a new uh, front of making money. And all people are engaging in singular monolithic systems as has been tried elsewhere and abandoned. So you'll, you'll hear this county or the other, they are planning to install this big digital connected one monolithic system. These systems have been tried in all the countries you hear about and failed. Some of you, if you have dug deeply, you might have asked yourself, why doesn't Microsoft not have a health information system the way it has a retail system? And if you go back in history, you'll find that Microsoft at one point was engaged by the UK government, the NHIS, to create what was called the Microsoft Clinical User Interface. And it failed miserably and was, uh, uh, was left and things went in a different way. Now, we should pay attention to the fact that our human resource is ill-trained for digital health system and it's often the first point of failure in their use. On the other hand, leadership and governance in the area of digital health is scarce and less methodical on how to implement and grow uh, an interoperable digital health information system. As opposed to clinical, you know, to purely clinical taking care of patients, we go to school, we are trained, uh, we are capacity built, we get certificate. This doesn't happen for an area that is highly professional. And activities are just here and there. You'll hear there's probably a university that has set up a, a degree in health informatics. You don't even know what it's going to achieve in that. Whilst we have made some efforts in technology, which is the other big arm, we're still emerging. And most of what we have done is not documented and it's not monitored on how it works and what it achieves. So if you look at this, New and emerging technologies like AI will continue to be used in isolated and ad hoc uh, health purposes, but we can't tap their full potential unless all players come together and create a truly interoperable health information system based on rules and standards and collaboration. So that is really what I would say is needed. Uh, and you can see it in terms of developing the necessary human resource, both at universities, uh, in the facilities, so that people are able to understand and use digital health applications, but also developing human capacity that is able to develop that and maintain these systems, putting into place technology that is required for these systems to run. I'm sure some of you have been to a hospitals and you realize even getting functional networking networks is a big problem. Yet we are talking about 
acquiring these big uh, systems that we will then put there and all of a sudden expect that they will work uh, in a magical way. So that's a, re a realist point of view, having been involved in developing a lot of these things and myself being a digital enthusiast. And I want to see things going forward. You also sought my views on the existing gaps in our current health system at the moment and the effects, impacts on effective health service delivery. And I'll say that many of the gaps are known and could sound academic if I, were, I was to list them. But I feel that the focus of our healthcare system towards secondary and tertiary care and its failure to empower people and communities to participate in our care is the biggest gap that we have. And this approach can only be real, uh, we can only change this approach uh, through primary health, a primary health care approach, as there is evidence that it contributes to UHC and sustainable development goals. And a paper written way back in 2005, when I was still a bit young uh, in practice, by a lady called Barbara, pointed out clearly how primary health care is the basis of uh, any health system. And you can imagine it has taken World Health Organization uh, you know, a, a lot of time to try and convince, get buy-in from government. And this happened, of course. Uh, and in 2018, you remember one of the things that we embraced as a country was the big four under which, uh, under which uh, uh, UHC was going to be implemented. That is not a, a, just a Kenyan, uh, a Kenyan government initiative, but it's an initiative of the World Health Organization through the Sustainable Development Goals. So as I'm concluding, uh, you, you sought my views, therefore, on the evolution of our national health system and the role of primary health care in bridging gaps in our existing model on health systems. And as I, as I observed, since 2018, under the big four, the national health system has been undergoing significant change to be able to deliver UHC and sustainable goals for which there is evidence that primary care is the best pathway to deliver this. You will know that as a country, we did a couple of uh, a couple of testing on UHC, and I think at this point in time we didn't quite understand what it was, and I think people are confusing it and still continue to confuse it uh, with universal financial coverage. And what we tried is providing universal financial coverage within our current secondary and tertiary care system, and basically it was unsustainable, and we had to change tack, and it was good. So policies and strategies on UHC, primary health care and primary care networks uh, were developed. And this will create a massive change in the structure of our healthcare system. I believe that we now have, uh, I want to believe that we now have lessons in medical school that teach about our healthcare system. As it has become more and more complicated, you will probably confirm to me whether this is the case. And in order to achieve UHC, the ministry has developed a strategy on primary health care networks. Uh, that will stretch from level four hospitals in what they are calling a hub and spoke model, going towards health centers and dispensaries, of which these two will be merged together. So you no longer have a health center and a health dispensary. It will just be one facility. And then going all the way to the community units. And this structure will be under family physicians who will work with a multidisciplinary team to provide care within a defined area where you are known very well, and uh, you know your patient. And I want you to think about the potential of this as it will absorb all the doctors there in medical school if you are to get it working. I think you may have heard the president recently mentioning something of employing about 4,000 of the unemployed doctors to work with community health workers. And it points to the fact that this information is trickling over uh, to the uh, highest echelons. And we hope that whoever is pushing it will continue to push it. Gladly, at least uh, the country has developed the right policies and strategies. All that is required is us going on and implementing them. I think I'll stop at that point, uh, at that point and hand it over to James uh, so that he can continue with moderation. Thank you very much. James, over to you. Um. Thank you so much, Dr. Derito. Oh, that's uh, that is um, wow. It's that's a lot that we've been able to capture. Um, 
coming all, all the way from the best summarized but honest history about um about where you're coming from and where you are right now uh and i'm so sure we have a lot of questions um a, a lot of follow-up questions and i would want to um so that you can be able to serve on time invite um, the rest of us to be able to um air out our questions as we even proceed um dr Dirito, there's a request um in the in the next session to be able to if you can be able to see you um even um as we answer our questions uh if that's okay in the end um so um i'll start with the uh, the first question um that's been asked by victor uh, does stone hmis have an open uh, apis uh, and how can can we able to get access to it Okay, would you want me to answer that first? Okay, am I audible? Yes, you could, you could answer that first even so that I uh, Okay, I quite don't understand what open uh, API means, whether it means that uh, uh, it's, uh, you can actually access the data that Stone HMIS um, has or whether it has APIs. Stone HMIS is constructed with APIs and those ones who are, are very well uh, aware about OP2, they are implemented using a, a, a REST server um, uh, architecture. And uh, uh, these APIs are really open to people who are authenticated by Stone HMIS. And it does authentication up to the level of machines so that we are aware uh, which machines uh, within which networks can access information. Because one of the things we've built around Stone HMIS is to be able to implement the fast help interoperable resources fire, uh, which most of you will know about, was uh, in the digital health uh, arena. And so, yes, you can access, but it's not like you will go to an open uh, uh, an open uh, uh, website and be able to access it. Uh, largely, Stone HMIS is, uh, can, run, can run on the cloud or within a local area network. And uh, we've done quite a lot of interconnectivity, especially wide area networks, like we did this in Trucana and we did this in CIA. And uh, what it's designed to do is be able to uh, be linked up with the uh, provider machines, with servers, as well, and be able to provide information for appropriately authenticated uh, users. But of course, for the information to be shared, uh, it has to, we have to construct what is known as a shared health record, which is one of the things it supports. And then patients have to provide us with uh, the authorization to be able to share the information with other uh, with other healthcare providers. So we just don't share that information for the sake of people getting it is for people to be able to provide care uh, to, to others. Now, Stone HMIS is largely implemented within our network of facilities, uh, which I have mentioned. And uh, we've done uh, a couple of implementation like in Trucana, where we were funded by UK Aid to try and see how it could improve outcomes in maternal care, which it did very well. Uh, but as I said, the level of adoption of digital health system in our setting uh, can be a little bit disappointing uh, because once a project is over, sustainability is often not there. And this has to do with a lot to do with interests. Uh, and so, yeah, you probably will go to a place you find fantastic infrastructure, which we put up. And uh, sometimes you'll find that it's not being used, especially within the public, uh, uh, public settings. And uh, we've tried to resolve some of these issues, but I'm not going to mention them at this point in time. I want to hand back over to James for the next question. I hope I have answered it.
um, I'm sure you have. I think the one who asked can be able to also comment. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, you, when while you were talking about uh, introduction of digital digital systems into um, the health sector and having it been uh, it failing in other system in other parts of the country, um, I I think you mentioned briefly concerning. Uh, how we can be able to to cap that uh, and not have uh, wasted resources being put into the um, uh, the health sector. But maybe if you could a bit uh, uh, talk about these policies that uh, that we can be able to uh, introduce, so that we don't have um, uh, digital uh, systems being introduced that are not uh, beneficial and timely uh, for our health um, sector at this particular time. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think I'll still go back to uh, something that has been done very well by um, uh, Measure, uh, a group called Measure, which works in the University of North Carolina. And they came up with what is called a tool of me measuring uh, the maturation, uh, the maturity of uh, an interoperable digital health information system. And they have defined various uh, domains. And if you look at those domains, the three main domains are one, leadership and governance, uh, two, uh, health, uh, uh, human resources, uh, and uh, three, technology. And within each of them, you have some uh, several subdomains. Kenya has done quite some, uh, some work in some of those areas. Like if you look at leadership and governance, you know, we have policies that define how things are supposed to be done. Uh, you'll also hear there is a, a bill that is being uh, created to try and bring some sanity in this area. You will hear there are some standards that have been developed as well. Uh, but as I said, uh, this is done on a need to basis. It's mostly supported by donors, especially who are seeking to try and streamline uh, the reporting in HIV care. So you may notice that a lot of the digital systems were really geared towards uh, uh, towards supporting HIV-related programs. And any extension to, around those digital health systems was really to support extended or com comprehensive care around HIV work. And I don't think the donors were really interested in going beyond that. So. From our end, we need to have ownership. And this ownership means one, training people, one, to develop the systems, uh, uh, to use the systems, and to even certify them and to have standards of those people. Look, can you imagine of a surgeon who can be trained by anyone, anywhere, without a system that works? What level of trust will you have in terms of their qualifications, in terms of their knowledge, and all that? So we need to actually begin to streamline that area because there's a lot of innovation going on. There's little collaboration. There's little putting together of these things and how they are. The other thing is technology. And then I'll begin with the area of especially what I'll call standards and nomenclature. And uh, I think earlier on, earlier this year, earlier this year or late last year, I think it's late last year, we launched what is called the National Health Data Dictionary. And there is effort, for example, to create a, a, what is called a digital health platform, something that could help define the basic minimum pieces of information or data uh, that should be collected uh, so that it can be passed and shared amongst systems. So we're still very far away in these. And so you can build your beautiful system and you'll be taken up in a, a specific setting but it may not move out of that specific setting or share that information because you don't have an infrastructure of sharing this information. Now, how do I see, uh, what do I see would uh, really be useful? If we allowed formation, first of all, of the basic infrastructure, you know, uh, making sure KHIS as an aggregate data system, for those of you who know it, functions optimally, making sure the community health master facility system functions nicely, uh, making sure also the health facility master list functions well, 
introducing a shared health record. All these are very basic building blocks of technology, but will require people who are trained. And I see this coming from clinicians who are interested in digital, uh, digital health. I see this coming from ICT people working with uh, people in that, uh, in that domain, uh, in, the, in the area of health, to build all these systems. And it'll, it'll take time and it needs to be done very early on so that we avoid having these silos, islands where everybody is working on something, but they come up with their own way of calling diff the same thing differently whilst the world already has figured out how to name them. I think we require leadership in that area. We require investment in that area. And we also require to say, what are the, the locally built uh, systems that we can actually adapt? Uh, you know, I have just explained to you how Microsoft tried to do a system for the NHIS and never went very far. I still see there is this feeling that we could go to India or go to China or some other place and import a digital health system. And often I want to disappoint people that it won't work because digital health systems are built very much with the context of an area. And what is required is not a spanking new system that's off the, the shelf, but having an infrastructure that allows any system built by whoever within whichever area can fit in and communicate uh, uh, communicate properly. I think that's what people haven't figured out or understood. And at the moment, the push is, oh, let's have this uh, very well integrated system that will do everything from where you are admitted to where you end up, forgetting that there are so many databases uh, that have to be created, standard databases. And I'll say, half of my time in creating Stone HMIS was just actually creating standard databases, pulling them up from national ones, pulling from international ones. And I would be doing these all alone and it was quite some tasking work, but that gave us the, uh, the basis. Still a lot of systems that are constructed still don't have a standardized way of coding this information. And you can imagine several systems all over, uh, where everybody keeping their own information uh, and they will never scale up and we will never have that uh, kind of earning we would expect because we don't have a, a common uh, digital backbone. I, I could speak a lot on this and sometimes get out of the line and make it another talk, but let me hand it over back to you. And hopefully I've excited a bit of you in terms of where the future stands in making sure we have uh, 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 better health information, digital health information system. Thank you, James. Thank you so much, Dr. Adi. Um, Something very profound. Um, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Eugene O'Chuli, who's uh, uh, raised his hand to ask a question. Uh, Eugene, you can you can unmute and ask. I'm probably uh, good afternoon. Possible good afternoon, as well. uh, Sorry, sorry, uh, James. Uh, my name is Eugene O'Chuli. I am a fifth year medical student here at the University of Nairobi. Now you have mentioned a lot of, uh, let's say, gaps that we need to address in terms of trying to come up with uh, ways to tackle the problems we have currently in terms of universal health coverage. We have mostly focused on secondary and tertiary levels of care. Uh, we are lagging behind, basically, compared to the other economies um, in terms of trying to hit a good universal health coverage and focus on primary health care. Now, I don't know if you have insights on where um, health seeking behavior and health, health literacy uh, can come in for patients in terms of trying to come up with these solutions uh, from your experience with uh, working in primary health care, uh, working in epidemiology with uh, the system that you have attempted to implement uh, maybe uh, what 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 opportunities exist for specific sorry specifically integrating um, health seeking behavior and health literacy as we try and tackle the other areas such as patient capacitation where we have always tried to uh, make sure they access these services but the health seeking behavior and the level of information that they have on the importance of maybe following up on their care is low. Thank you, 
Thank you, Eugene. Uh, it's a very important question you asked. And I think I would summarize it in one, uh, one point, which is a from the primary healthcare approach, the primary care approach that uh, was relaunched in Aptana. I think it's in Aptana in 2018, which identifies three arms. And uh, the middle arm is empowerment of uh, people and communities. Uh, that's a key approach of primary healthcare. And what you'll find is uh, an approach, a secondary tertiary care approach really does not engage the communities, does not get engaged patients, uh, or let's call them not just patients, does not engage people well in advance before they become unwell. And uh, the only relationship that exists between people and healthcare workers is that of you are unwell, you come to me, I prescribe a drug, you go home, and I see you again when you're unwell. But when you think about uh, places where uh, primary health care has been implemented very well, uh, you see that there is very little distinction between the health care provider and the patients in terms of where they live. And if you look at the uh, principles of those people who practice things like family medicine, one of the things that is said is that the practitioner must actually be able to live within the community in which the patients come from. And it emphasizes a lot even to do with home-based care. And at the moment where we are, we are emphasizing what you call community health, uh, community health, uh, community health approach. So yes, for us to increase the literacy and health knowledge, we have to have our healthcare workers not, not sitting in one large tower or waiting for patients to come and see them, but working daily, uh, uh, to promote health uh, amongst patients so that uh, instead of just relying on secondary and tertiary promotion or prevention, we are providing the primary prevention that starts with, uh, 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 with risk, uh, risk reduction and elimination of risk uh, before uh, an early identification of disease. You know, if you think about it in terms of like five, five components all the way from the community. So there are like three components which we need to engage in. And that would improve the, the, the literacy of the patients as well as their health seeking behavior. And of course, if you think about it, this education would require uh, for those people who are, uh, who are interested in digital systems, a lot of this literacy would be provided through digital systems. You are lucky you are at an age where interacting with, uh, uh, with phones, inter interacting with computers is no longer seen as a preserve of a few people, but everybody can do it. In my generation, there's still a lot of resistance to it. And you know, I was seen as, a, as, 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 as one awkward fellow who went towards digital health systems, whereas most of my colleagues are happy not to do it. So you need to see and seize the opportunity to be able to build uh, con consumer health information systems that will be able to educate our people on these things and how to seek care. So I see a large opportunity. Yes, you're, you're, you're right. I see a large opportunity, both digital as well as in rejigging our healthcare systems to take care of people and educate them early on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um... Thank you so much for that. Um, you can keep your questions coming. Uh, I know I'm aware that time is is uh, far gone. Um, I don't know. If I can just summarize the questions that we have, so that we, we can be able to also be um, convert to the time. Is that okay? okay? That's okay. Thank you. That's okay. So there have been concerns, and I'm sure you say that. Um, You've been you graduated back in 1999, and you've seen the different eras of uh, and different transitions uh, in the medical sector. And there are very many concerns that have been raised uh, um, from different people uh, in the chat concerning uh, where is the future um, um, of of, uh, of the medics in this country? Is there a future at all? Um, we have the issues with the Cuban doctors. Um, what is the future of all of these Cuban doctors? Um, they are unemployed doctors over 4,000. Um, what is the future of these 
uh, these doctors. And also they are still more being added every year into the market. Um, and basically is their hope. Um, so um, they, there is that question. Also, there is a question, um, of, um, Lucy Maina, um, as doc, is there, in your opinion, what steps could be taken to ensure that our healthcare system is more equitable and accessible to individuals, regardless of their socioeconomic backgrounds? Um, yeah, uh, and what are the, um, from Victor Kenneth, uh, what are the different regulatory uh, policies around health data? Um, you talked about uh, FHIR, uh, what else are there? I think you can be able to have them, then you can have the last two and, uh, and, and conclude if that's okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and indeed, I, I really feel your concern as uh, doctors in training uh, regarding the future of medicine in Kenya, having observed the issues that are there and some of your colleagues being unemployed and also seeing the issue of Cuban doctors, and so you wonder what exactly is going to happen. I don't want to say things are going to be very easy, but I think this is uh, a question that has attracted the attention of many people. And you heard me mention about the president and his 4,000 doctors, the 4,000 doctors and community health workers. And that is simply him stating that I understand and I am being told about UHC and how it should be implemented. And uh, just by doing that, he could employ all those people. And I think we have that capacity. Uh, however, let me just tackle the issue of the Cuban doctors. Why were people so much interested in Cuban doctors? And you see this came more from the counties. It's simply because the Cuban doctors themselves are, are primary care physicians. They live and work where, uh, where uh, they are trained to work. And I think that was the attraction, that they could do so much in one sitting, comprehensively review a patient, uh, give them integrated care in one sitting, and complete it. And this is what, of course, mesmerizes a lot of people when they go to Cuba. What, has, what magic has Cuba done? The only magic Cuba has done is adopted a proper primary health care system. That's, that's all. And in fact, I answer that with a, with a question from Lucy about equitability and accessibility. Lucy, PHC, the main component of PHC is to achieve equity. And uh, if I can be honest, I'll tell you that uh, already there is, a, there, there is trying to determine uh, what packages will be made available. And I think there's somebody mentioned there are like 16 packages that are being prepared that will be avail availed at the level of PHC. So the only way for us to achieve equity and access is actually to introduce PHC. And now that, was, of course, has the hope for the majority of, uh, of physicians and doctors who are being, uh, who are being, uh, who are being trained, uh, because then you'll be required to go and work within the communities where these people are, where the communities are, working there, like the way, for example, a chief sits in a place, they know their own people, they understand them, they know what is affecting them. And so you're within that locality. So. Uh, I believe that PHC is the way forward. And I would say, let not the issue of Cuban doctors become uh, a frustrating issue, but let it be for us as uh, medics, the ones in training to understand why is it that our people are preferring to get them and not us. And it has simply to do with orientation of the way they provide care and the way they've been trained. Can we do that and be able to be the ones to take those opportunities so that it's no longer necessary for our government uh, to go for those uh, physicians. Uh, finally, in terms of health data regulation, I think there is quite a lot that is coming up and we have to distinguish health data uh, from health management information systems uh, and, and they all tend to mesh into each other. So if you're thinking about standards, there are standards and I have mentioned about FHIR for interoperability, that's an international standard. I've mentioned about ontologies, these are not really regulations, but forms of practices. These are data dictionaries. And uh, I've mentioned that we have one in Kenya at the moment that was launched last year. But you also have policies uh, and architecture documents that have been defined and uh, you can quickly find them 
uh, within the guidelines, uh, uh, the government guidelines. Uh, there's, of course, you've heard about, um, uh, recently you've heard about this uh, uh, Office for Data Protection that has come up, and that is going to be dealing more with how data is handled, not about uh, digital health systems per se, but the fact that, uh, uh, of course, there tends to be incredible amount of theft, and I have seen an incredible amount of theft of data, uh, even from our telcos, and uh, from uh, businesses. And I, I do worry uh, that if we don't have proper laws, then people will actually begin to do the same with health data, which would be very unfortunate. So I do support the emergence of these, uh, uh, these regulatory mechanisms, but also hope that they are going to facilitate the growth of digital health systems. There is a lot in that, and that's an area perhaps one of you will do good to study on later on, uh, as you, you you begin to do masters in health information and whatever else that you may do to guide uh, these uh, these area, because a lot of things have just been developing organically. But we do need to think, like we said, of leadership and governance in that area, and part of it is data ethics. Back to you, uh, uh, Enthusi. Um, um, will. We'll have the last set of questions. Um, then I'll be able to hand over to uh, so that you can be able to finish. Uh, no time is spent. But um, so um, this is Lawrence who uh, who asked. So how does HMIS deal with biosafety and biosecurity? I think this is partly what we talked about, especially in the current era of bioterrorism. And coupled with corruption, genetic patient information, or any other. Thank you very much. I'll begin with a question from Lawrence on biosafety, biosecurity, and HMIS. At the moment, one of the things I know, and I'll be very honest, is that every facility that is working by itself collects its own data. And it's usually at the level of those facilities to maintain that data. So if you go to Camry, you'll find they have certain sets and rules and practices of regulating that data. And I think some of the uh, some of the things and gaps we are having is actually being able to you know, have a framework of how to control and maintain this at a national level. So uh, I wouldn't say like, for example, the KHIS really collects any biosecurity, biosafety data uh, that uh, would uh, easily be sneaked out. And most of the information itself is probably just scattered within machines. And maybe that is why we still don't have a big issue uh, because you don't have like one big uh, uh, national repository where all this data is being collated, uh, is being collated and can easily be hacked and taken away. So it still exists within uh, different uh, organizations. But as our systems mature, uh, this will obviously happen. We share data more and uh, it will require that growth in leadership and governance, especially around data ethics. Somebody has asked about donors controlling data. And yes, I have worked with donors and especially uh, CDC. They're very, very strict in the way they handle their data. Extremely strict. And they put uh, patient safety and patient privacy first. So before you can get any data from their, their projects to use, you will have to justify it. You'll have to have proper... Uh, proper ethical approval and uh, their systems tend to be some of the most secure I have seen. I have worked as an ep epidemiologist for a long time and just getting data from donor funded programs is usually very difficult because they requ it requires some formal, uh, some formal engagement, requests and uh, approvals. And I think those ones are necessary. It's only that obviously what we should have done right from the very start is equally developed our systems so that they are able to protect patient data to that extent. 
And uh, you'll be aware that at the moment, CDC is actually building the capacity of counties to try and take over uh, uh, take over HIV care. And some of the things they are going to be helping build are these ones. It takes time, it will be slow, but it will be necessary. And I can see that is going to happen. And I hope that by the time this is done over the next uh, couple of years, then we will have built those systems to be able to equally protect uh, uh, our data. Uh, finally, in terms of pay, most of our pay in Kenya is based on your job group. Uh, so regardless of whether you're a surgeon or whether you're, uh, uh, you're a physician, people are paid according to pay groups. So if you have done MPH and you are in the same pay group as a surgeon and you're a doctor, you're most likely going to be earning the same kind of money. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nderito. I think you have uh, even uh, exceeded what you even desired uh, or even thought. Thank you so much. We really appreciate for your time. Uh, having considered that even uh, past uh, the time is uh, about 14 minutes. Um, at this um, juncture, I want to thank you uh, all for joining. Um, and I want to uh, uh, welcome uh, Ntusi to give a vote of thanks and uh, go conclude the session for us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, James. Um, Dr. Ndiritu, before I give my vote of thanks, I actually, one, I actually have one question. And it's on how it's basically centered around the KMV6. Um, we must thank you, I mean, if we are to be honest, for the fight and the courage that you actually took because we believe and we actually know that because of your efforts, Camry actually restructured um, the entire hierarchy. And the government now actually plays an oversight role that's more intimate with the organization. And then matters such as financial compensation for even employees, that's something that has actually been streamlined and is no longer um, subjugated to racial bias. So we must thank you for that because sometimes you never really appreciate the privileges that we have um, and we fail to understand that it's actually because of our predecessors who were dedicated to our profession and also to our nation's health and um, on the same so I just want to ask um, if by some strange chance you were to go back in time um, would you have still done the same thing and what lessons would you say you've learned from tackling or even being vocal um, and trying to challenge like an entire um, racial system, like in global health, as you pointed out. I don't know whether my question is um, quite clear, but um, yeah, that's what I wanted to ask. Thank you. It's it's very clear. Uh, it's very, very clear. You're asking me, would I still take the same risk? And I think, yes, that's who I am. That's what I am. I, I am highly conscientious. I work hard. I try to do things uh, you know, in the best way possible. And when I find systems are unfair, uh, at one point I will chip in and say, no, uh, this is not fair. And if the system doesn't listen to me, then I'll turn up the, the heat one way or other. And of course, I would still uh, do the same uh, because then if you don't do that, there's never going to be change. And of course, all of us are not going to have the same sort of courage. And it's not to say that uh, my career didn't take a hit. I think I would say that my career took a hit uh, because I was seen more as a troublemaker uh, than a person who was actually putting forth uh, a, an honest point in view. And this is not unusual in history, and we knew about this. And uh, so I would still do that. Uh, there are people who wouldn't do that, um, and uh, you know, for that, for that, for that thing, we are for that reason, we are we are all different. Uh, but I would still do that, and I think it's unfair uh, to have systems that are constructed around uh, uh, around discrimination. Thank you. Thank you for for your response. Um, at this point, I'd like to thank um, you, Dr. Ndiritu, for making the time to actually meet us. I do remember when you approached with the later mile. Um, we really didn't know how to figure this out. But with your guidance and with your support, we've been able to have quite an engaging session. Thank you as well for opening up about um, deeply emotive issues like the experience that you faced and the challenges that you also encountered 
um, in your career path. We do not take it for granted. Um, and another question is um, not really a question, but more rhetorical. Like, why why are we doing this exactly as as Amsun? Well, we do understand that our current um, employment climate is is a bit hostile towards young doctors, and you wanted to reach out to individuals like you who've gone above and beyond um, in your endeavors, and you've actually improved the system that we exist in. And it is from these lessons that we actually want to learn and tailor so that we can actually have career paths that will be fulfilling and also have broadened perspectives um, like the one you've shared. So thank you for that. I'd also like to thank um, James. Thank you for the excellent job. You've moderated this session quite well. I'd also like to thank the Endgame team for this wonderful um, uh, support that you've given us. Also, my Amsun um, Executive Committee, all of us for creating the time because it is a Saturday night and we could have been doing many other things, but we all saw the need to actually join this meeting. And sorry, there's someone in the waiting room. Oh, and also like to thank the later Maya as well for he took the time to actually get this going. And um, I just have one request to everyone for posterity. We usually want to crown it off or finish these sessions with um, a selfie of sorts. So if Maybe James could coordinate it. Maybe if we could just uh, turn on our cameras, like our videos for a brief moment so that we can take like a really nice screenshot, all of us, um, for posterity. If you could kindly um, like just try to turn it on to make it more interactive so that you also remember the session that you had. Okay, so I guess um, James can actually guide us. Like, what do we say? <laughs> as you take the selfie. Oh, <laughs> um, I don't know, Entesa, I don't know, but I think that's what <laughs> exists people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we'll be one, two, three, go. We can say Entesa, as James pointed out. So one, okay. two, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, one. Two, sorry, sorry, I was three. having trouble. Yeah. So. It's okay. Mpesa. No. Nice. Mpesa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I guess that's it. Um, thank you, everyone, for making the time. Uh, yeah, I guess I'd like to wish you all a lovely evening um, and we'll continue engaging more in this series. Thank you, Dr. Andritu. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. All the best. Okay. Thank you.